Hey you guys, so earlier this year I had an incredible opportunity to meet up with a fellow female backyard farmer who has done incredible things with her small space and even runs a seed company out of her backyard. It's incredible. And today I'm gonna to bring you her story. Her name is Brigitte of San Diego Seed Company and she has done so much. She's kind, she's knowledgeable, and she's got an amazing seed business. And this holiday season for the first 20 people to use my code, hey, it's a good life, you're gonna get 50% off orders of $100 or more. Now that's only for the first 20 people, so I wanna make sure that you guys know about this, so don't miss out. That is an incredible deal, and it's an awesome way to support a small business this holiday season. So I hope you guys enjoy this video and feel encouraged to grow food in your small space and dream your wildest dreams, because that is what she has done, and her wildest dreams have come true as she's brought the seed business to life and has a thriving backyard farm. I hope you guys enjoy this video. Well, hey guys, welcome back to Hey, It's a Good Life. I'm with my friend Brigitte on her farm out here in sunny San Diego. And today we're gonna go on a tour and share with you a little bit about what she does for her company, the San Diego Seed Company. a little bit about what you do here on the farm. So we own San Diego Seed Company. We're a small seed company based in Southern California in San Diego. And we are the only certified organic urban seed farm in the United States. So, so it's cool. pretty unique what we do and how we do it. Um, on our farm, we do breeding, trialing, and seed production. So we produce seed that we put in the packets that go in the racks in the stores and that you buy online. And we uh, do breeding projects with universities and then we trial. We actually grow everything out to make sure it does really well here before we include it in our catalog. Because as you know, you know, not all cabbages will produce in San Diego, um, you know, and things like that. Although most tomatoes will. Mm. Um, but we, we trial to make sure that our customers and our growers get uh, quality seed that does really well here. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember you talking about how you guys are almost um, formulated for like specifically the Southwest, mm -hmm. right? Yep, so we focus on the Southwest. So the things that we really um, put time and energy in is things like drought tolerance. You know, we don't get a lot of rain here. Um, our cool season products, we focus on uh, cool season products that will actually produce in our warm uh, winters, even though right now it's, it's freezing. Last week it was 80 mm -hmm. and I was so mad because I was like, no, winter can't be over. Um, but I could watch my broccolis immediately just try to go to flower. So um, we just focus on our climate and our needs um, and getting varieties that do really well for our customers. I didn't really decide, it really chose me. <laughs> All of this just happened through life experience. I grew up in Kansas where agriculture is king, but then when I moved to San Diego, I realized that agriculture can take very different forms and it doesn't have to be, you know, thousand acre farms. It can be very small farms. And I think just my love of the earth is what drives everything I do. I love nature, I love being outside, and I want to do everything I can to help the environment and um, eat good food while I'm doing it. So all of the, these things just came together and here we are. We are on a farm, okay, but it's an urban farm. Yeah. What is like, what are we working with here? How many acres? So, how many square feet? Well, the whole property itself, from the front to the back, is an acre. Um, okay. And where we live, we're a couple exits from downtown San Diego. That's a lot of property, but for a farm, like my family back home in Kansas, they they say I'm not really a farmer. <laughs> but I am really a farmer, I'm an urban farmer, and uh, we produce massive amounts of seeds and produce on this very small area. So um, the area that we actually grow on is probably, um, uh, just about a half an acre is actually production. Um, we have over 50 rows, and last year alone we produced over 60 pounds of certified organic seed. Wow. So I know 60 pounds doesn't sound like a lot, but it's seed, right? Yeah. So it's small, so it's a lot of seed. That is a lot of seed. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, you guys know I'm on a mission this year to help you guys make the most of your small space, so I'm really excited to be here. Let's go for a tour. Cool. The way that we grow on our farm is we do row cropping, um, which you know is not a normal way that people, or a common way that people grow in small spaces. Most people do boxes um, and pots and things like that. 
We do in-ground because we can get things very close together. Our rows are about nine inches and then the walkways are about 12. So we can really maximize our space. Um, and then we don't do boxes because um, I like the flexibility of being able to, you know, change my rows if needed. I will say when we first moved into the property three years ago, the soil was terrible. And so we did have uh, basically just two by tens that would hold in the good soil because we couldn't afford to just fill the whole acre with good soil. But now three years later, after intensive um, soil development, our soil is looking really nice and we don't need those that wood to hold in the soil. The way that we developed our farm was by bringing in truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of compost, manure, mulch. Um, we have a, a friend who's an arborist with help, which helps a lot. And we have brought in hundreds of truckloads of mulch to try to um, keep control of the weeds and keep the moisture in. And it's really, really helped. When you have really terrible soil to begin with, um, you, you can just layer on top the really good stuff, but it takes a really long time. So in the beginning, we had to incorporate the organic matter into every layer of the soil, and we did that by tilling. Mm -hmm. Now we've gotten to the point where we do not have to till. Um, in fact, we do we abide by a lot of the lean farm principles, and we will just pull out a crop um, and leave. Uh, we'll cut it at the top, leave the crop in so that its uh, roots can just disintegrate in the ground and, and feed all the organisms, and then we'll just plant right next to it. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, that was not possible mm -hmm. because this was just a barren wasteland. There was no water back here um, it had not been irrigated at all for years so you can imagine what that soil was like um, but now year three uh, we're, we're really starting to get somewhere cool. um, growing your own food should not be cost prohibitive if you can be um, you know smart about how you source your your things so um, we do through a program called chip drop you can get free chips um, most uh, areas have it I think it's get ch uh, free chips or getchipdrop.com um, but an even better way to do it is actually just to call around to arborists and find out who's an arborist that frequents your neighborhood and see if they'd be willing to give you the chips instead of taking it to the landfill. That's how we source ours and what was great too is we could decide what we wanted, what kind of chips we wanted and um, if we wanted stumps and things like that. We also make our own compost which is uh, incredible. Um, and then we also use compost from the Miramar Greenery, which is a San Diego uh, resource where they make compost. San Diego resource that is wonderful. Um, we can use that product on a certified organic farm. And it is, um, they make compost, they make mulch, um, they make all kinds of different products, basically um, by sourcing food scraps from large universities and areas around San Diego. great things that we get to do as a small seed company is we get to source varieties from local seed savers and then produce them and make them available to all growers. So this variety of sweet pea, uh, we actually call it Point Loma Pops and we source this seed from a friend of ours that has been um, growing and saving the seeds for over 20 years in Point Loma. So uh, we got seed that was already really well adapted to our area um, and you know she only had a tiny bit of it and she gave me some, and we've been producing it for the last couple of years. Uh, this, this whole row will be another round of seed production that will go into our seed packets. Um, and as you can tell, they look beautiful. Uh, even with all of our crazy weather we've had lately, there's not a spot of powdery mildew. Uh, they're really happy, and they're going to be loaded with blooms, which is really exciting. Oh yeah, look, this one's almost open. So what's really cool too is, um, so she gave me some seed and then she uh, had a little mishap in the garden, which we all do, and left a basket of seeds out. It rained, they got ruined, and so she thought all of her 20 years of work was gone. But luckily she'd given me some, I had some reserved, and so we saved this variety from basically becoming extinct. So just one of the cool things we get to do. Perennialization is basically a gift to all Southern California growers <laughs> if you know how to utilize it. We understand what perennial means, right? It grows all year long. So perennialization is where things that are typically annuals will perennialize, they'll grow all year round because, of our, because our climate is so mild. Now this totally depends on your microclimate. Um, if, you're, if you're at higher elevations or lower elevations um, or anywhere that gets harsh weather, 
this won't work. But where we're at, we're zone, um, zone nine or 10, uh, we actually can grow tomatoes year round. So these tomatoes, you can see how huge these stalks are. These have been in the ground for two seasons and they are super happy. We get tons of tomatoes on them. Um, and the reason why we can do this again, I want to stress is because our climate is really mild. Considerations if you decide to let your plants perennialize. Number one is never leave a plant that is diseased or not healthy in your garden. It will um, not be good for all the other plants. You don't want something that's infested with insects or uh, foliar diseases to be left in your garden so then it can uh, affect all the other plants. So we go through and we trim these quite a bit to, to keep good airflow and then also just to keep them happy and healthy. Um, and we don't, when we plant our tomatoes, we never plant them with the expectation of leaving them to perennialize. Uh, if they're really happy and they're doing really well, we will leave them. We have some varieties that we know do really well. Um, and one of those is our San Marzano. Mm. We grow San Marzano year round, every year. We love it. It's my favorite tomato for making salsa. Um, and it just will grow really well throughout the summer, well into the fall, and then all the way through the winter. Um, but again, if you're trying this at home and your plants are not happy, they're diseased, um, you should rip them out. When you're growing things through the winter, remember that the sun is lower in the horizon. And if you're in an urban space, sometimes that means that an area of the garden that wasn't shadowed before will become shadowed. Uh, your tomatoes need as much sunlight in the winter as they can possibly get. And so if, if they don't have full sun exposure, I would say they're not gonna do good. Go ahead and rip them out. These are our perennialized eggplants and um, they look terrible because we got really cold last night and they actually got a little bit of damage from that. But um, these are actually for seed production. So these ginormous eggplants will get ripped out we will chop them up, we will extract the seeds, we will process them, they will go through quality um, testing, germination testing, vigor testing, and then um, if they pass all that, then they end up going in the packets that you buy from us. So that's just an example of, of how we use perennialization on our farm. The nice thing about if you're growing in a really small space, if you're growing in a pot, it's really easy to fill that pot with the best soil possible because it's a small area. So, um, you know, even if you have a patio, get a pot. It can be a pot that you get free off Craigslist. Um, fill it with some really good soil. Maybe you buy it from the local nursery and you can do a lot of things in that small pot. Grow your tomatoes, your peppers, your herbs. Um, and it is a slippery slope. You will soon become addicted and then you'll want your own farm. Good question people ask is why would I build a greenhouse when we live in Southern California? Um, this thing can become so hot, it can be just, you know, uh, it can fry up your starts in no time. Um, we really like the greenhouse because it can keep in moisture and that's the thing that we don't have much of in Southern California. Um, Whenever you build a greenhouse, there's a certain amount of vent space that you want. I think it's like at least 25%, don't quote me, but I wanna say it's like 25% of your, your square footage. In San Diego, even more. So the way that we did it is on the sides and we actually can just roll up the plastic and that allows for cool air to come in from the bottom. It's very manual. I have to be home a lot, which is fine. Um, I like being on the farm. Um, but I will roll it up and then I can change the temperature quite a bit. The other consideration that we did was the angle in which we built this was important. We get a lot of uh, wind from the coast, which is cool wind, and so we positioned it so the wind could blow. We positioned this so that we could uh, take advantage of the crosswind that happens on our property. We get wind from the coast that's cooler, that comes this way, and so I can get that wind to blow through the greenhouse and cool it off quite a bit. Um, the other consideration if you're building a greenhouse in Southern California is make sure that you have a way in which you can put shade cloth on it or there's also um, like a, a paint that you can put on the plastic uh, that will basically diffuse some of the light and keep it cooler. Now with all of that being said, we still abandon our greenhouse come probably July not just because it's really hot but also because we have seeded everything out and we're so busy tending to everything else on the farm we're not doing a lot of seed starting at that point um, there's about a two month window where it sits empty and um, we actually close it up and let it get really hot and hope that that burns off pathogens and things like that the thermometer in there can read easily up to 1 
30, 40 or more. It gets very hot in there. It's vacant for a few months and then we actually start our cool season crops, which is so hard to start in the fall. I totally get it. Um, but we will actually start them in there because the we can use the greenhouse to hold in that moisture and get better germination. And then we'll move it to the north side of our property underneath the jacaranda tree, which is nice, diffused, cool, cool area of our property. Our dream eventually is to build a shade house. Um, we're not there yet. Only one house a year is all we can build. <laughs> uh, but cool season is really hard because like this year we were really cool and it felt like fall and it was beautiful. And then as soon as I planted my broccoli, the Santa Ana's came and it shot up to like, you know, 95 plus degrees. Um, and that's one of the struggles of growing in Southern California is uh, sometimes we don't really get a winter. We try to utilize our greenhouse as much as we can is, um, we actually put our shade cloth on the inside. Partly because when we built this, I wanted it to be a gable style greenhouse just for aesthetics. I thought it would be cool. <laughs> but getting shade cloth up and over this at the highest point, it's, you know, 14, 15 feet is really difficult. So we actually run the shade cloth inside. And what's nice is I have wire that I've run on both sides of the greenhouse and I can open it and close it as I need. Um, last week we were 80 and I had to have this up and then the next week it was totally super cold and so I took it down because I wanted this to warm up. 50 plug trays, I like that size. You can start a lot but then not have, you know, like the 120 plug trays I think are a little too much. Uh, but you'll see I even have my carrots here which I know is crazy but these are very easy to transplant out. Time consuming but I can transplant each each individual one out, perfect spacing, and guarantee that uh, I'll get a good carrot harvest. Most gardeners do not like to trim or to thin their baby plants. So this is kind of one of the ways that I avoid that. Um, and usually we don't, we don't um, plant them this thick in a cell. We'd actually put less, but one of our um, interns planted those a little thick, but not a problem. You can stick that in a bucket of water, you can rinse up the soil, and you can transplant them individually. But when we do our seed starting, we try to put one cell per square. Like, here's a good example. We've got um, onions. Most people direct sow onions, but I can. I can transplant these guys perfectly two inches and really maximize my space. Which, if you're growing in a small area, it's a lot more beneficial. Additionally, in the greenhouse, I can get far better germination because I can keep in the moisture, the temperature's perfect. I can get quicker germination too. I'm not waiting two weeks for something to germinate. I can get it in and out really quickly. So it's what makes sense for our farm. Not, not every farm um, or backyard, this is the system for you, but I highly recommend um, even if you um, are just a semi-serious grower, I, I would recommend checking out the Lean Farm book. It's one of my favorites. This I actually put in just a couple weeks ago. Um, it took us a while to, the, the greenhouse has been here for over a year, but I finally installed this little window. Um, but the reason why we did it is because um, I can open this and the cross breeze, I mean, you can feel that breeze coming yeah. through here. and. The reason why we didn't put this in the moment I installed the greenhouse is because I wanted to wait a year. We installed a windsock, which sounds totally dorky, but we installed a windsock sock and we basically monitored where the wind was coming from on the property. And that helped us make a decision on where the best spot would be to put a window vent in, um, which happens to be on this side. I can open this up, the wind will blow through straight out the front door and I can drop the temperature in here by 10, 15 degrees easily. One other consideration for your greenhouse if you're deciding to build one or buy one is always start small. The bigger the greenhouse, the harder it is to regulate the temperature and the moisture. And I know it's tempting to be like, oh, I want a 10 by 10 greenhouse. Um, but the smaller it is, the more you can really regulate all the factors that will lead to good germination and successful seed starting. So that's my tip, start small. <laughs>
When we're doing seed production, it's really important that we do seed production of the best quality. So by transplanting them out, um, I can gauge their root development, their vigor, and make sure that they are super healthy and happy. And then we actually go through again, and we will, after they produce their root, we will pull them up, size them, rate them, and then plant them back. And then they will go to seed, and then we can guarantee that we're getting really uniform roots. So for seed starting in Southern California, it can get very confusing, and especially if you're not from Southern California, like if you're from the Midwest and you've moved to Southern California, it gets very confusing because our systems are very different. A lot of places in Southern California, zones nine and 10, don't necessarily have frost. So it's really hard to look at just any garden book and figure out when you want to start seeds. For a generalization, to give you an idea, you need to think about seed starting as two seasons. You have your warm season, which is your spring and summer, and then you have your cool season. Your warm season, which is what we are going into right now, we're in February, we're moving into our warm season, that is when you're gonna start things like your tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, eggplants, watermelon, squash, the list goes on and on and on, but it's all warm season. That's how we organize things on our website. We have cool season products and warm season products. We've actually already started our tomatoes, which is a little early, but we have our greenhouse and we also put a heat mat down. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, the Solanaceae's really like a little bit of heat underneath them. And so you can get a very inexpensive heating mat from uh, any nursery and that will aid in the germination of those of those seeds. They will germinate a lot quicker and a lot more evenly. On our farm, right now, we're starting all of our warm season stuff, but we're also putting in our last round of cool season stuff. So we're doing our last round of lettuces. We are sowing our last round of carrots and beets and things like that. And the reason why we do that is I wanna eat good veggies all year round. And so we will succession plant uh, as long as we can to make sure that our pantry is full of organic goodness. This is our compost making system. Very basic, but we like to keep it basic so that we can change it, alter it, um, also make access really easy. So this is just wood that's basically holding our compost in place. Um, I like this method because I can get in there easy with a shovel and move it around. I really don't like compost bins that you have to bend over. It's really bad on your back to lean like that. Um, and again, as I've mentioned earlier, I like to try to save my body. Um, so this is easy. I can get in there, we can flip it, we can dump it with the wheelbarrow, we can move it with the wheelbarrow. It just makes for a nice, easy composting system. So this is where the magic happens. The seeds that we process outside come in here. Um, after they've gone through all of our quality testing and then eventually they make it into our packets. Um, we just did a big campaign on Indiegogo and thanks to all of our supporters, we raised 120% of, of the funds needed um, to basically change this packaging into front and back full color packaging. We went from this, which was a sticker that we put on the front, which was great, uh, but as we're growing, we need something a little bit better. And so now we have updated our uh, logo, a little slicker, a little newer, um, and then we have full color front and back, and this has a bunch of growing information on it. Um, it's got the season, like I said, the planting season, cool or warm, you're gonna know, or year round. It's got the ideal soil temp, planting depth, plant spacing, it'll tell you how much seed this packet will um, sow. So basically an area that you wanna plant. And then also has our pro tips on here. So it's got information that's specific, that uh, it's things that I've seen over the last 10 years of growing my business and my own farm here in, in San Diego. Um, it's tips on things that I've seen people do wrong and tr so I can try to help them maybe avoid it. Like um, not overhead watering their plants is a big one. So um, we're, we really want these to allow gardeners to be even more successful and I think it's gonna happen. We really pushed our education and our outreach and I would like to see that continue. I want to continue to influence and support and inspire growers. We have a campaign called A Million Urban Farmers and the goal is that we want to inspire, support, and educate a million urban farmers because we want people to realize you don't have to have 10 acres or 5 acres to become a farmer. You can do really good work 
on a very small scale and really influence the people around you to do the same. So we're hoping that we can continue to work on that and get more people excited about growing.